And today I'll talk about building the next generation of Bitcoin apps, looking at where we are today and really how do we get to, you know, have, helping people to innovate on Bitcoin and getting away from maximalism. So the question obviously is why Bitcoin? I don't think I have to go into much detail on this, but what's important is that Bitcoin has between 100 million and 300 million users worldwide, depending who you ask. It's growing faster than the internet, and Bitcoin really started a movement to create a trustless, decentralized, and transparent financial system, and I think we're really you know, making good steps towards that. But there is a challenge, and the challenge is that while Bitcoin focuses on mass adoption and is the asset that is known outside of crypto, it has penetrated various sectors ranging from financial institutions over grocery stores and even governments. But there is a chasm between adoption and innovation. While Bitcoin focuses on adoption and you're getting users to use Bitcoin, all the cool new stuff, right? DeFi, DAOs, NFTs, although we have ordinals now, but in general, all the advanced things happen outside of Bitcoin and maybe later are somewhat ported or engineered somewhat into Bitcoin in some strange way. And honestly, it is a controversy that Bitcoin, the thing that started it all, is the only or one of the only assets where to do anything more than payments, you have to go to a centralized provider. So the goal is, and that's our mission, is to really unite and find intersections between Bitcoin's adoption and not just technical, but especially also political power and values that it has globally with the innovation that we have on Polkadot, Ethereum, and all these other chains. Now, if we take a look at building on Bitcoin today, it becomes pretty clear that we're quite limited in what you can do. If you want to build on Bitcoin, you can try to do that. Bitcoin does have a scripting language, but it doesn't have smart contracts. And you can't really do sophisticated things. You cannot build a DAO. You cannot really do sophisticated lending markets. And you have limited scalability, right? We all know that Bitcoin does, what, seven to 10 transactions per second. And the moment you have a, some hype, it fills up. So people have tried to do other things, right? So people have tried to build tokens on Bitcoin. So you probably all heard about the recent BRC20 hype, and then there's other versions of that that are older, like RGB colored coins. But they also, what they allow us to do is tokenize things, represent some token on Bitcoin, coloring some Satoshis that you can move around. But that's not smart contracts. And also you inherit the same scalability issues that you have with Bitcoin itself. Now, Lightning is a very well-known solution towards scaling. So Lightning tries to process transactions off-chain, make them instant, and really get people to make fast payments with Bitcoin. But it only supports payments, and it's quite hard to use, right? If you really want to use Lightning in a trustless manner, you really need to understand the revocation transactions. You need to be online, or you need to trust somebody else to be online for you to make sure that if something goes wrong, you can exit to the main chain. And as a result, if we look at Lightning adoption today, it only has around 5,000 Bitcoin locked in Lightning, and 90% of Lightning usage is through custodial wallets, which defeats the entire purpose, right? Like, are wallets really better suited to custody Bitcoin than institutional custodians? No, they're not. And we're even trying to get away from institutional custodians. So what has emerged over the last few years are so-called side chains. So side chains are Bitcoin focused, blockchains that try to connect to Bitcoin and extend its functionality by adding some smart contracts. And that's a cool idea, but all of these sidechain projects today rely on centralized bridges. So to bridge between Bitcoin and this sidechain mechanism, you trust a third party, a centralized service, which again kind of defeats the purpose. The tooling, surprisingly as it is, is not compatible. So it's not that you can use Bitcoin libraries on these sidechains. No, you have to use Ethereum libraries and or something else and rewrite the tooling that you would usually expect that, that you use on Bitcoin before. And the biggest challenge is that they're isolated. So these systems focus on Bitcoin, they target Bitcoin core community, Bitcoin maxis, you could even say, um, try to convert them, which is a great thing, but they don't talk beyond Bitcoin. They're not connected to the rest of the ecosystem. And on the other side, right, in the rest of the ecosystem, on Ethereum and L2s and Avalanche, Polkadot and so on, well, Polkadot, let's exclude, um, you do have Bitcoin, but it's all centralized again. You have centralized bridges. The tooling is, again, not really compatible, and it's kind of expensive, right? Ethereum is not cheap to use, and if you go to an L2, you trade it off for centralization. And as a result, what happens is that building a Bitcoin today concentrates on wallets, 
custodying Bitcoin, so holding and not doing anything with it, and centralized financial products. So again, building more centralized services that control your Bitcoin and offer you some centralized services on top. And this is why we said, uh, oh, last point actually before moving on, but the demand for Bitcoin in DeFi is actually very high. At its peak, over 400,000 Bitcoin was bridged to other chains, which was around $9 billion at that time. But again, 99% of that was centralized. And the question that we ask, is it really DeFi if your bridge is CeFi? No, it's not, right? If you use a centralized bridge, then your security is as strong as the weakest link. And if you're trusting a centralized operator to bridge your assets back and forth, then it's really, it's CDFI at most. And we all know that there's been a lot of bridge hacks and over a billion dollars worth of assets have been stolen from bridge hacks only from the ones where asset control and key management was the issue, not even counting the smart contract exploits. So this is why we started building Interlay and our goal is to really build a platform that enables Bitcoin innovation. And over the next few minutes, I'll walk you through the journey that we've made and how we hope to onboard the new generation of Bitcoin builders. Now, Interlay V1 went live more than a year ago, actually. Um, and it went live as the first fully decentralized Bitcoin bridge, um, powered by economic security and cryptography. And on top of that, we had this layer, what we call multi-chain connectors, obviously being part of Polkadot allowed us to connect to all sorts of parachains and service them with Bitcoin, but also in the near future, also connecting to Ethereum, Cosmos, and other chains through this interface. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with Interlay, I'll quickly walk you through how, through how the decentralized bridge works. So probably those of you who have used crypto before are familiar with bridging. The issue is that Bitcoin only exists on the Bitcoin blockchain. So to use it in Ethereum or somewhere else, you need to wrap it, meaning create a representation of it on another chain. And the challenge is that most bridges work as follows, just like a centralized exchange. You deposit into a custodian, and you trust that custodian to return the Bitcoin to you. And obviously, um, I think I'm covering the stage here, if they don't return your Bitcoin, there's nothing you can do. Now, the idea of Interlay is to decentralize the set of custodians. So on the internet or today, anyone here can become a vault operator. You can go register, spin up a vault. But the challenge is, I don't want to trust anyone in particular with my Bitcoin more than I trust, you know, would trust some centralized entity. So how the system solves this is by requiring vaults to over collateralize. You lock collateral in different assets and that collateral serves as incentive to not steal Bitcoin because if you misbehave, you will lose that collateral. And then the rest of the system works pretty straightforward. It's the same as depositing into a wrapped asset for the user. They lock with vaults in step one here. Um, the system cryptographically verifies that your Bitcoin has been actually locked using a cross-chain light client. So the same thing that you have on your phone when you run a wallet. Our system, our network syncs Bitcoin block headers and can hence verify transactions. So you cannot really lie to the Intel network. It always knows what's going on on Bitcoin. Right, so you've bridged over, you can use your IBTC in what, for whatever you want, and if you go back, in the good case, you get the Bitcoin back and the vault collateral is unlocked after they have submitted a proof that they actually returned your Bitcoin. But in the failure case, and that's where it's get interesting, you get reimbursed in collateral and you know that you will not face financial damage. But one of the challenges of this bridge model was always scaling, because locking up collateral introduces a capital efficiency challenge. Vaults need to pull up collateral and that limits the amount of Bitcoin that can go into the system. And obviously this bridge is now competing against other DeFi opportunities because on that capital you could be earning some revenue or yield somewhere else. And the way we scale this now is by introducing liquid restaking. So we solve this capital issue for layer one collateral assets like ETH, DOT and so on by allowing vault operators to first stake the DOT and ETH and so on, and then use the liquid staking representation as collateral. What happens? You earn revenue from the bridge and you earn staking rewards. And in the midterm, long term, what happens also, you drive more DOT, for example, to the relay chain staking because we're no longer competing. And the outlook for this is that in the long term future, if potentially validators will start operating vaults, you get very close to near optimal security where you only trust BDC and Polkadot proof of stake really at the validator level. 
Another thing that we've been doing that is quite innovative is we reuse DeFi capital. So specifically, this is interesting for stable coins. Instead of just putting USDC, USDT into vaults and again competing with other DeFi yield opportunities, what you do is you first lend now to the stable coin, take the lending position that's tokenized, put that down as collateral. And again, you're earning interest in the lending protocol and you're operating the bridge. And the great benefit of this is also you're creating deep liquidity in the lending market, which again helps grow the ecosystem. And another outlook on this is to experiment with EMM liquidity uh, positions, which allow you to create more interesting constructions like using stablecoin pairs as collateral or even more exotic assets. And this really gives vault operators flexibility and the chance to really not have to choose between DeFi and securing the bridge, but doing both. And this is actually quite innovative. You probably all have heard about restaking and you know, on Ethereum there's a lot of companies or like two or few companies really trying to push a narrative. But in fact on Intel we've been doing that for quite some time and it's actually live in production. So as I already kind of hinted, Intel has evolved from being only a bridge to becoming a one-stop shop for true Bitcoin DeFi. So on top of this bridge, we have now deployed a decentralized exchange and a lending protocol that plugs into that bridge and hence allows you for the first time in history to trade, borrow, lend against Bitcoin in a fully decentralized manner because this thing is decentralized from the stack. You don't have a centralized bridge in the middle as opposed to all other systems. So what happens, we have a Uniswap v2 implementation and the Curve v1 stable swap plus a Compound v2 lending protocol. And this exchange or like this platform will focus mainly on trustless Bitcoin and providing you the chance to get access to blue chip assets like layer one assets, stable coins, and potentially also other more centralized Bitcoin variants so people can get in and get out. And the cool thing and what was actually been going on in the past few weeks, months, is that we've been finalizing the deployments and in Right now, the community is actually voting to activate the DeFi button until a next week. So for all of you who are using Bitcoin and are interested in Bitcoin DeFi, go on, on to interlay.io and sign up to be one of the first to, be, to get access to that system. But that's not all, right? So we've actually talked about the core building blocks, but on top of that, you can build so much more. So one of the exciting things that we've been working on and just combining these existing building blocks now is to have strategy builders. So one of the challenges that you have with Bitcoin as opposed to proof-of-stake systems is that in proof-of-stake, when you have DOT or ETH, you can stake it, right? And if you're holding it for a long time, it's naturally the most instinctive thing to do. But with Bitcoin, you don't have access to staking. What you have to do in theory is buy miners or you know, trust somebody to run miners for you, which is again, centralized by layer. On top of that, what we really took to heart is making it easy to use the platform. So we have bring your own fees, which is I think a general necessary feature across all platforms. We have this one click strategy builder. And as some of you may be aware, Intel has been spearheading the efforts to get fiat on and off ramp providers into the ecosystem. We've secured a deal with Banksa, one of the leading players in the space for 10 Kusama parachains. Um, and that's already being integrated. And on Polkadot, the bounty proposal should be going live over the next few days, weeks, to provide funding and really cheap and reliable integrations for up to 20 parachains with an on and off ramp provider. So users can really easily just gain access, test application, and not you know, worry about where do I get the gas token. But now we've talked, okay, what we've built so far, and all of this is finished. This is all done and it's going live next week. But what next? Because obviously we don't stop here. Our mission is you know, not to be the only builder in the space. What we want to do is enable others now to build on Bitcoin and really drive innovation. And another issue is that, well, Bitcoin, you know, we want to help people achieve financial freedom through Bitcoin. But financial freedom means different things to different people. And in, how can we you know, assume that we know what people want to do with Bitcoin globally? And so the goal is to really decentralize and allow people to build on Bitcoin in a proper way. And to this end, Intel v 3 is becoming a modular middleware, a programmable layer between Bitcoin and the multi-chain ecosystem, compatible with both substrate, EVM, and having Rust smart contracts that allow you to use Bitcoin libraries. Now, why Rust? Bitcoin loves Rust. Everything built on Bitcoin over the last couple of years that is new is using Rust. Lightning, Noster, indexers for, for BRC20s, and so on. 
And the benefits are massive. You can reuse Bitcoin core libraries. For those of you who code, you know how painful it is to really re-implement core functionality and low level in new programming languages, especially Solidity. You can reuse code from existing centralized Bitcoin apps, modify them slightly, and you suddenly have a smart contract. And finally, for more advanced things like custody and you know, like more of this new crypto stuff, most of these things, nearly all of them have Rust implementations. So again, you just plug in, you don't have to re rewrite everything, and it's a massive improvement in terms of time to market, plus Rust has a massive community outside of crypto as well. The Bitcoin, like parts of the, of the Linux kernel are being rewritten in Rust, right? So that kind of hints towards the future adoption of this language. But as much as we love Substrate and Rust, we have to admit that EVM is still something that we need to pay attention to. Wallet infrastructure, custodians, ledger, they're all skewed towards EVM compatibility. And we can always compete and we can fight against them and ignore that, or we can level the playing field, make sure that this is EVM compatible, that people don't have to make the choice, but they can have both EVM compatibility and build on Rust and learn and get the benefits of Substrate. Um, so what this does essentially, it allows you to really on-ramp users, convert EVM wallet users to this new ecosystem, and for people who want to build on Bitcoin, you don't have to choose anymore. You get Rust libraries that interface with Bitcoin, but you also have EVM compatibility, which interfaces with everything else outside of the Substrate ecosystem. It's temporary, but it's necessary. Now, another point that is quite important is that after five years of doing research on cross-chain bridges and really spending a lot of time of trying to design the perfect solution, we realized there is no one silver bullet. There is no one thing that, like, there is no one solution that fits every use case. IBTC today is a fungible asset you can use in any application within Substrate, Polkadot, and also other ecosystems. But you, we can do better. We can potentially get completely rid of the collateral requirements by building tailored solutions. A good example for this are atomic swaps. If I only need to do a, one swap, there is no point for me to wrap, swap, and then unwrap again. I just do the swap directly. And it's much more efficient, does not need any collateral. The same thing you can do for lending, stable coins, and other protocols using some more advanced cryptographic primitives like multisigs, obviously with large institutions, if you have institutional clients, right? right there's a lot of businesses accepting Bitcoin as collateral for mortgages. They don't need a fully decentralized asset. They just want a safe way to custody Bitcoin and get access to advanced tooling. Threshold signature models allow you to decentralize things that are currently centralized on Bitcoin. So lightning nodes, wallets, indexers, run this and allow people to really access these services in a more decentralized manner and build on top of them. And then you have more advanced things like discrete log contracts, zero knowledge contingent payments, and all of these things really allow us to improve how people use Bitcoin, give them more opportunities. And what we're trying to create here is a marketplace. There's tons of companies building different solutions, threshold models, multi-signatures, and the goal is that they can offer this to builders and users and institutions as a service to build on top of this and get access to more tailored solutions. But of course, for DeFi, for DAOs, IBTC, the fully decentralized solution, still remains the most reliable. So, in summary, Intel A is really positioned to become the next platform for Bitcoin innovation, starting from trustless bridges and custom custody models with built-in DeFi functionality connecting to the multi-chain ecosystem and not being isolated, but welcoming builders from both Polkadot, Ethereum, and other networks. And on top of that, really focusing on the Bitcoin functionality, having Rust as programming language, integrating with Bitcoin core functionality, Bitcoin libraries, and really providing you with the necessary tools for user experience and on and off ramps. And with that, thank you so much. Um, join us on our mission. Our goal is really to enable innovation for Bitcoin. If you're a Bitcoin builder, if you're interested in experimenting with that, um, follow us on Twitter, join our Discord, and obviously, if you're interested in DeFi, go to intel.io slash DeFi Hub to check it out and be one of the first to get access to the new platform. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexei. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for the first part of the impact stage. Uh, now we're going to have a short coffee break, and we're going to be back here at 6.15. So please.
be back now enjoy your coffee 6:15 once again thank you so much and see you in a while